Hey guys, this is Garrett Wong, also known as Ensign Harry Kim from Star Trek Voyager, and you're watching Astronomy Live. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Hi folks, welcome to Astronomy Live. So I just recently got the telescope finished on its setup and uh, got it in focus here on Arcturus. And now I'm going to train the guider and the adaptive optics unit and then we will move on and start doing some actual imaging. I'm running a little bit behind schedule because I ran into some serious trouble on the alignment with the mount. Um, it was because of the wedge and uh, it's a whole lot easier to relieve pressure on a Mead standard wedge than it is to apply pressure on a Mead standard wedge to uh, lift up the base of the wedge to change the angle. It's a lot easier to let it back down than to push it back up with the telescope on top. So I had to pull the telescope off entirely and then uh, adjust the wedge and then put the telescope back on to get it to the right angle. Uh, it had it had sagged a little bit in terms of the angle and it was not at the right latitude setting since the last time I used it so I fixed that and got it aligned and it needed a pretty serious iterative alignment at that point um, and that took a little more time than I was anticipating fortunately I'm starting on time technically but uh, still finishing some initial setup process here so we're going to do 0.1 seconds on the auto guider, but we're actually using the main imaging chip as the auto guide chip for the moment for calibration purposes. This is still Arcturus. I'm just going to take an image there. Okay, that's all fine. We're going to take the slack out of the drives, make sure that drives are free to move. Give it a little more north motion, make sure that the declination drive slack is taken up. There we go. And we're going to calibrate the drive, so we'll do a calibration on the drive initially. And we'll do, then we'll do a calibration on the adaptive optics unit. So tonight I'll be using an 8-inch LX200 Classic. The camera is an SBIG ST2000 XCM. And uh, on top of that, it's attached to an SBIG A07, which is a tilt tip mirror adaptive optic system. So, it looks like the drive is calibrating properly. It's moving the star up, down, left, and right to figure out how it needs to move it in order to achieve the right. Um, the right response. Okay. So and then I'm going to look at the calibration results here. It's not symmetrical about the Y axis because of the drive slack when it reverses direction. So I just clone it and that fixes that. Now we're going to calibrate the, well first we'll take another image, just make sure everything's still set, then we'll calibrate the adaptive optics, and we'll do that. Alright, so calibration is complete, and telescope is focused, so the next step is to simply move on to our target of interest. And we could go for some deep space imaging, although the moon is 
quite bright past first quarter now so it's uh, fairly bright out tonight not ideal conditions for deep space imaging can still work with that um, I'm thinking that oh this is Comet Palomar is that right oh hang on I might be looking at the wrong comet there let's see I was thinking of going to hunt for a comet oh that's the right one Palomar I was thinking it was a pan stars, but it's actually a Palomar discovery. That's cool. The Zwicky Transient Facility. Is that the, uh, is that a repurposing of, uh, the old, uh, Schmidt that was used for the, uh, Palomar Sky Survey? I think it might be. But anyway, C2020T2. Okay, let me get the coordinates for that up on Sky Safari Pro. Also, let's take a look. Oh, I don't want you to be that loud. Jeez. Okay, what do we got to choose from in terms of guide stars? 11.5. Ugh. That's, that's yucky. What about that one over there? That's a 7.2. Okay. I like a magnitude 7.2. Let's see, how do I do this again? There we go. So I basically need to turn the camera 90 degrees. Well, I'm gonna have to recalibrate that. But will that work? Will it fit, is the question. Uh, that's a just barely doesn't exactly do great in terms of image composition, but I can make that work. So basically, uh, well, we can recalibrate when we get to the target anyway. It's a magnitude 7.2 guide star. As long as I get that guide star in there, it'll be nice. So. never quite sure of which direction though because it's kind of mirrored and it gets me a little messed up in the head in terms of which way I need to turn the cameras at 90 degrees clockwise or counterclockwise I'm not sure well we'll try one of the directions and see if we get on the guide star <sighs> what are we looking at right now we're looking at Arcturus hopefully in a moment we'll be looking at a comet C2020 T2 Palomar or, yeah Palomar Perfect. It's just a hop, skip, and a jump away from our last position. So, let's see what we have in the auto guider now. Do we have a really bright star? We have a star. I wouldn't call that super bright unless my eyes are deceiving me. Oh, no, my eyes are deceiving me a little bit, I think. That's, that's pretty bright. Is that the one we're looking for? Could be. Yeah. It's possible. It's possible. It's certainly workable. 
I'll live with it as long as the comet is in the field of view. That's the real question, isn't it? Is the comet in the field of view? Secondly, assuming that's the right star, it needs to be up at the top of the field of view of the autoguider in order for the comet to be where I need it to be in the main imaging chip. This guide star is going to be used by the uh, adaptive optics. Oops, wrong way. I don't want to go east. I want to go west. E, wrong way. Wrong way. It's going to be used by the adaptive optics to keep the stars perfectly sharp. We're going to be tracking on the stars, not the comet. Hopefully the comet's moving slowly, slowly enough that it doesn't blur too badly in, say, three-minute, five-minute exposures. We'll see how it goes. But the adaptive optics unit's going to track this bright star, the one on the left in the little box, and keep it centered. Well, it's not really going to keep it centered. It's just going to keep it in perfect place at a very high guiding rate using a tilt-tip mirror system to compensate for any drive errors and for the atmosphere. Okay, now... Is that good enough? Oops, oops. I didn't mean to do that. be looking at that star instead, in which case, nah, I don't think I am, but I could be, if I, if I am, I'm, I'm pointing in the wrong place, we'll find out in just a moment, so I'm go this way, go this way a little bit, That's fine there, I suppose. A little, just a little more. Okay, now... We're going to auto-guide at 0.1 seconds to start with, see how we do on that. Oh yeah, that's really easy, it can, it can go more. We do 0 0.05. Can we do 0 0.05? Yeah, we can. Very nice. So we're guiding at 10 hertz, a little more than 10 hertz. We're going to start saving these images. This is going to be... Uh, Palomar. Q2 Palomar. We're going to use the imager. We're not going to bin them two by two. Well, I say that. Actually, we will bin it two by two. We're just going to do a quick... Uh, let's go for 30 seconds to start with and just see if the comet's in view. See if we're pointed where we think we are. So, it won't be color images yet. It'll be black and white, grayscale, um, to enhance the sensitivity and just verify our pointing position. So we're going to take a quick 30 second exposure and see how things are going. Okay. Well, I like what I see. If I am looking at things correctly, which I'm pretty sure I am. Yeah, the stars are all lining up. That's definitely the comet right there. I'm 99% I'm sure of it. it. It's all matching up very nicely with what I'm seeing in the Sky Safari Pro. So, very good, very good. Okay, so, all right, we're going to... Pause the auto guider for a second. We're going to pause the imaging for a second. 
So we will go to full color images now, one by one bending. I'm going to count on the fact that the telescope should still be focused. I haven't slewed it very much from the initial position. Uh, let's see, how quickly does this thing move? Not, not very quickly. I can definitely get away with it's the motion, apparent motion. I can probably get away with at least three minute exposures. So that's what we will do. We do one by one, three minute exposures. Just trying to judge it based on how quickly the comet is moving. How long can I do an exposure before it starts to motion blur badly? I think I can get away with three minutes. We'll see. And this exposure will also tell us, are we are we still well in focus? I think we are. Based on the guide star, it looks pretty sharp. We really should be. Uh, am I going to image the upcoming lunar eclipse? Well, that's a very good question. I think if it's the one I'm thinking of, I don't think we have a very good view of it here in Florida. In fact, I think we don't even get to see totality in Florida. Oh, uh, where's the NASA page for this one? It's coming up, isn't it? March, May 26th. Earth sky should have a map, hopefully. Well, here we go. Here's the map. Yeah, we get to see it's it's um, it's setting here in Florida as it goes into the umbral portion of the eclipse before it even reaches uh, totality. So. If I'm reading this chart right, yeah, we're we're out of luck here in Florida. So basically, no, it's not worth my time. I mean, maybe I'll get a still shot of it, but it's not worth streaming it because it'll just be a disappointment for everybody. It'll be a total eclipse elsewhere in the world. Uh, you know, if you're in California, you'll get to see all of totality basically, uh, unless you're sort of on the east side of California, like west western side of California. Looks like you get uh, the full totality experience as it's setting. Which would look spectacular, to be honest, um, by eye. Not as great in the telescope, to be honest. But uh, anyway, no, it's not a not a very good one for me, unfortunately. It's been a while since I looked that one up, but I, that was what I recalled being the case. That uh, it was kind of a bad timing for the eclipse here in Florida. All right, let's see how this image looks. Oh. So it will take a three minute dark frame now. Looks good. There's the comet. So it's going to take a three minute dark frame with the shutter closed to eliminate all these colorful pixels. These are hot pixels, just effective pixels on the camera. Every camera has them. And you can see they're all red, green, and blue, very bright colors, because each pixel on the camera has a filter over it that selects for red, green, or blue light. And so the 
pictures are when they're downloaded are interpreted each pixel is interpreted as being red green or blue depending on the filter that it was assigned and if, if the pixel is defective it registers as a very intense color and so that's I think uh, Bayer matrix and so it goes through this debayering process to make the whole image this is how all consumer cameras basically work as they have um, color filters over each of the pixels in on the CCD or, or CMOS on the sensor itself and then that matrix of colors is interpolated to create the whole image but when you're running very long exposures like this of very dim things uh, you can see defects in the pixels uh, a lot easier. You can see these hot pixels lighting up in these very long exposures. So we do a dark frame calibration to co compensate for that. Sheila Trigg says, outside 20 minutes ago I saw something the size of a typical star with a naked eye across from the moon heading west to east. wonder if it was the space station or a satellite. North Carolina coast. It probably was. Um, I think other places in the country were getting a space station pass tonight. They're pretty high beta angle right now. And so they're in sunlight almost constantly. Um, and so if it passes overhead at night, there's a good chance you'll see it. Um, we didn't have a, a very good space station pass here tonight. I think the maximum altitude was something like 10 degrees over the horizon. But, uh, yeah, it's possible that could be what it was. I, I haven't looked it up for North Carolina specifically. Ooh, you've got an Evo Star 80. Sorry, Evo Star 80. Dequade Man. That sounds like a nice uh, scope, some sort of 80 millimeter apo, I guess. I'd like to get one of those sometime, one of these days. I feel like I don't do enough wide field imaging to justify it, but I also feel like if I got one, I would do more wide field imaging. Could ride it piggyback on top of the LX200 and uh, get some good images. So, right now we're looking at Comet C-2020 T2 Palomar. Uh, this was a comet discovered in the year 2020 at Palomar Observatory. It is currently 212.7 million kilometers from Earth, or 1.42 astronomical units, or 11.82 light minutes. Ooh, that came out bright. Huh. Do, do, do. Oh. Hmm. Jeez, I don't know why uh, the histogram is so wonky. But uh, nevertheless, it got rid of the hot pixels. So that's good. And so the mouse cursor is pointing at the comet. After this next image, we should see some motion of the comet. Six hundred millimeters focal length. Oh, very nice. Yeah, that'd be a fun, fun one to play with, especially with a camera like this. Honestly, they have much better cameras these days. The ST two thousand is definitely long in the tooth, but it works very well with this telescope. Yep, I'm filming right now. This is live from the telescope as we're watching Comet C-2020 T2 uh, Palomar. And that's what you're seeing the mouse cursor pointing at. Now, I'm reacting to the comets pretty late. You may be noticing there's more delay than normal. I actually upped the delay to one minute tonight deliberately because there was the potential for a... Uh, Space Denier, who was supposed to join me, he thinks that uh, space is fake and I'm faking all this footage and such. I invited him to come in and uh, join the live uh, stream and hang out and uh, explain how I'm faking it and show him that I'm not faking it in real time. 
but uh, I upped the delay to one minute in case he actually took me up on my offer so that if he decided to try to uh, bomb my stream with foul language to get it taken down or whatever, I could just uh, cut him off before it went live. But he didn't show, so as a result I now have a one minute delay on the stream for my own safety in case something like that happened. But uh, since he found out that when I was inviting him on, I wasn't just inviting him into the live chat, no, 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 I was inviting him to actually come in and on a hangout and actually discuss it with me on microphone, suddenly his courage went away and he decided not to join. Evo Star has amazing optics, been doing some moon tests, it's very good, using a Canon T7i for imaging. Oh, that should be pretty good with the moon, yeah. Pretty good in general. T7i is a good camera. Um, yeah, one of these days I'll get something like that. So yeah, you can see that comet's slowly moving from image to image. You have to watch it at the image transitions, but uh, it's definitely doing something here. I am going to go in real inside real quick and uh, just check on these images because I'm a little uncertain about how well they're actually calibrating right now. Uh, so I'm going to check it on my desktop monitor real quick and I'll be right back. But I'll put on some music for you guys to set the mood here. A little bit of stellar drone for the evening here. <sighs> and I'm trying to decide, I guess I'll take it out of the playlist. There are two stellar drone songs right now that are getting false copyright claimed on YouTube, or rather, content ID claimed on YouTube, where they'll try to steal my monetization because they claim it's some other song that it isn't and uh, they steal the money and we're talking about Universal Music Group doing this too we're not talking about a small fly-by-night type thing it's quite disappointing so just to avoid the headache I'm going to take those out of rotation but to uh, put on the rest of the Stellar Drone songs
Alright, so I did check on the desktop and uh, I'm pretty sure what's going on uh, in terms of the amount of light in the image. This is actually just stray moonlight. I think the calibration's all fine and everything's running well, but this is as good as we can do this close to the moon in the sky. In fact, let's see, what is the angular separation right now between this comet and the moon? Uh, 31 degrees, almost exactly, so, yeah, the comet's 31 degrees from the moon, and this is how much stray light you're going to get in a long exposure with the moon that close in the sky. It's not all that close, but it's still close enough to mess things up quite badly, as you can see. But uh, good enough to see the comet, nevertheless, and that's the main goal here for this evening. is to watch this comet slowly moving, drifting past our planet. So, according to Aerith.net, which is a website that has some nice Overview information on current bright comets. C2022 Palomar is uh, currently brightening. Uh, it's currently about magnitude 10.6 as of May 12th. It should stay observable at around magnitude 11 in good condition for a long time from spring to summer. It was discovered on October 7th, 2020. at a magnitude of 19.3 by the Palomar Observatory and the Zwicky Transient Facilities Twilight Survey. And yeah, it's just at about the peak of its brightness. Not much of a tail visible, really. I mean, it's fuzzy. You can tell it's kind of fuzzy from the coma and the outgassing. But, you know, we're not looking at a really long tail on it or anything. When I do some stacking and stack the images, you might notice a bit of asymmetry in the coma and sort of a hint of, I hesitate to use the word tail, but sort of where the coma is being blown back by the solar wind a bit. And if I'm reading the orbital elements correctly on Aerith.net, looks like the closest approach to the sun uh, is at about two astronomical units, so it's definitely not uh, crossing Earth's orbit. So you can rule out any hope of getting a new um, meteor shower from this comet or anything like that. What software am I using? Oh yeah, CCD soft, yeah, you see it there. Yeah, it's, it's old. It's not really designed to work with Windows 10. It barely even worked with Windows XP. Um, and it definitely has major issues with Windows 10. So, the best thing to do when using CCD soft is to not touch anything else in Windows while it's running. Um, don't open up any other Windows. Don't manipulate anything in Windows. And you better hope that Windows Updates doesn't decide it's a sweet time to start installing things because it will just interfere with CCD soft in bizarre ways that actually affect the, the images somehow. I don't know if it's something to do with the drivers for this old camera or something to do with CCD soft itself, but it's just, it's not great. But it, it gets the job done. It, it, you know, works with the AO7, integrates it with the uh, camera, and I just know how to use it. I've just used it for so many years, and now I'm just sort of stuck using it. <laughs> so... Uh, comet something something. Yeah, this is a Comet C2020 T2 Palomar. Let 
and that's right where the mouse cursor is. And if you look from image to image, it should be slowly moving from left to right in the image. The camera's actually turned 90 degrees, so keep in mind this is not true orientation by any stretch of the imagination. Plus, the image is mirrored because of the telescope. But, um... You should see it... gradually moving from left to right. Yeah, and it's near Arcturus in the sky. Just a few degrees away from Arcturus. Not too far from the moon either, unfortunately. About 30 degrees from the moon. So we're dealing with a lot of moonlight that you see there in the image, especially up towards the center, which is actually top of the frame that you're seeing here. We're zoomed in a bit. Uh, I was getting some complaints about the blinking of the exposure for the auto guider there. I like being able to keep track of how the auto guider is doing in terms of how frequently it's updating, but uh, we can move that so that the bar is out of the view. I just want to get it so that I can only see, there we go, the main camera blue bar. And I can still see the guide rate on the auto guider, but other people are getting annoyed by the blinking of the auto guider exposure, which is running at, you know, 10 frames a second. Have I used sharp cap? No. Um, no, I haven't. Um, I've heard of other people using it, but I mean, this is just sort of my integrated solution for everything because I can do all of my imaging and my guiding in the same program. It's kind of handy. I guess I don't know if sharp cap would let me do that. Um, I don't even know if sharp cap would really work with an old camera like this, the S Big, plus the A07. The A07 is critical. To making this whole setup work. It really w runs way better with the A07 than it ever did before. Uh, the tilt-tip mirror system has this very quick response time, and the ability to guide 10 times per second really allows it to compensate for any drive errors, any, you know, and to some extent, atmosphere distortions too. So I can really get, you know, nice images with sharp round stars that regular guiding just wouldn't give me because of um, gear slop, because of uh, slack in the gears and drive backlash. Uh, you can use backlash compensation all you want, but it's never going to be as fast, not nearly as fast, as the tilt-tip mirror system. So the A07 is critical to the setup. So anything I use has to work well with the A07. We are looking at, and I'll move my mouse cursor back to it, we are looking at uh, C2020 T2 Palomar. This is a comet, a long period comet, which is currently about 1.42 astronomical, astronomical units from Earth. It will reach its closest point to the Sun on July 11th of this year. It has an orbital period, according to Skysfire Pro, of 5,547 years. So catch it now while you can. And its uh, perihelion point is about two times the distance to the Sun from Earth, uh, the average distance from Earth to the Sun, two astronomical units. Mainly been focusing on the moon and using auto stacker. Yeah, so you don't have to guide or track. Mainly use Photoshop for processing that. Well, I'd recommend, I mean, it's up to you, of course. Uh, I use, I, I typically use Registax for lunar planetary stuff. 
but auto stacker is very popular as well um, yeah Photoshop will work for for processing lunar planetary stuff pretty well I do a lot of deep space stuff I do a little bit of lunar planetary I'm really more space station tracking these days than anything planetary per se and that's a that's a whole nother ball of wax um, with a very different camera but the um, for, for deep space imaging I tend to use PixInsight as well as uh, Deep Sky Stacker. Hey Heat Shield, glad you could join us. I like your I like your new avatar there, the Elon Wario. Oh no, what's gone wrong there? Something's gone wrong there. This is why I like to pay attention to okay, stop, stop, stop. We have lost the guide star. We have lost the guide star. What happened? That's why I like to pay attention to that blinking bar. Okay, sorry. In the future, blinky bar has to stay around because I need to be able to see that it's blinking properly. It lets me know that I'm not losing the guide star like I just did. I don't know. Maybe a cloud flew over. If it loses the, the guide star at all for even a moment, it will chase its own tail. Oh, it's chasing its tail. What is going on there? Why are you chasing your tail? Oh, maybe... You know, I, I have a horrible feeling that I've gone and done something terrible here. In fact, I don't even know how this worked to begin with. <laughs> I've gone and done... I've gone and done a thing. Okay. Alright, first of all... We're going to turn off autosave on this for a moment, because we're not going to save this garbage. Oh, dear. Okay. I think I forgot to recalibrate everything after I turned the camera 90 degrees. How did this thing even work to begin with if I did that? Man, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry, CCD Soft. I really put you through the ringer. <laughs> I really think I forgot to... I forgot to recalibrate. Oh, my gosh. That's a very critical misstep there. It's a miracle that didn't happen earlier. I think what happened is it... Once it... Uh, I'm not even entirely sure what happened. I'm not even going to try to speculate. But basically it was doomed to do that at some point. Because it was trying to steer based on directions that were 90 degrees off. Uh, no, it's... Well, I can't say it's strictly not visible from the southern hemisphere... But the declination is 26, positive 26 degrees, so it's not as well positioned for the southern hemisphere, I'll put it that way. So I'm recalibrating the auto, auto guider now. That should fix that problem so it doesn't run away on me anymore. Um, yeah. Oh, I know what it is. Yeah, I know what it is. Okay, so what happened there, I think, is because could be wrong, but I, I suspect that the turning of the camera affected the auto-guiding inputs for the telescope itself way more than it affected the inputs from the mirror. And so when it started using the, the telescope drive to try to recenter the star in the auto-guider, in the uh, adaptive optics mirror, it really got messed up. That's where it really got messed up. Alright. Let's turn the music down a little bit. So, I'm going to redo the full calibration, including the adaptive optics unit as well. But Yeah, so, it's... I can't say it's not visible from the southern hemisphere. It is, but it's way better in the northern hemisphere. In fact... The declination is such that it goes almost straight over my house tonight. Um, so yeah, it's it's currently just past the zenith, really, and starting to set. But it's still over 80 degrees high from my location, so it's it's perfectly positioned for my house, basically, in Florida. So yeah, you could see it from the southern hemisphere technically, but like I said, 
I wouldn't describe it as a southern hemisphere comet right now. It's a uh, better position for us northerners. Yeah, it depends on how far south you are. I mean, theoretically, at 26 degrees declination, if you're further north than um, about 64 degrees south or south latitude, uh, it's above your horizon. But the further north you are, the better. The closer to the equator you are, the better, I should say, for the southern hemisphere. Okay, well... Alright, let's move this guide star on back, because... I went and I did a thing that was the wrong thing. That's going to mess with my time lapse. <laughs> I was going to do a time lapse of this comet. May have to restart the time lapse at this point. Okay. And again, I apologize to my viewers who are annoyed by the flashing blue bar at the bottom, but I need to be able to see it. I've got to be able to see that guide star. I mean, I guess what I could do is I could just move this window. Okay, this is a bit annoying, but... I'm expanding this so I can grab onto the window and move it down this down so I can see where the comet is and now I can move this down but still keep an eye on the guider and make sure that guide star is still locked on well because if I lose lock on that guide star I'm in real trouble as you saw Comet's name is C2020 T2 Palomar. Yeah, technology is great when it works. Well, that was a that was a pebcac right there. Problem exists between keyboard and chair. Because I forgot to calibrate recalibrate when I turned the camera 90 degrees. I'm pretty sure I forgot, and that's that'll do it to you every time. Like I said, I'm amazed it didn't do that earlier. But I think it's when it started relying on the telescope's drive system to scoot the star back within the range that the mirror can tilt. It went the wrong direction because the calibration was totally off, and it just lost the star. And it was all downhill from there. But now that it's recalibrated, it should be fine. Knock on wood. As long as no clouds fly over. If the guide star vanishes out for a second and it loses lock on it, it'll just t chase its own tail and start steering around in random directions. Anyway, I, you can tell right away because it, it produces a double image in all the stars and the comet itself. Sometimes it produces a triple image or it just produces streaks. It just does goofy things when it's chasing its own tail. That or viewers bug by the bar that could set something in front of it. Yeah, I mean, I would have seen it a lot sooner if I hadn't blocked the bar, but it still would have been a lost image either way. I just would have been on top of it faster. But it was still my mistake that led to that in the first place. However, that is the, the rationale and why I like to see that flashing bar. It's like the heartbeat of the camera. But as long as I can see the guide star itself, I can tell it's actually updating and lock, keeping, keeping a good lock on this star right here. And that star, for reference, I can even tell you what star that is. That star, not that it matters, is HD 118905, also known as SAO 82928, also known as BD plus 272276, also known as HIP 66627, 
Uh, it's also in the Tyco catalog. is 2001-0588-1. And it's in the constellation Boötes, and its visual magnitude is 7.15. So that star right there represents about the dimmest star you could theoretically see by naked eye with averted vision under perfect dark sky conditions. Um, that's about the dimmest star you could possibly see. And to my telescope, it's very bright. Very bright. It's uh, even bright in these 0 .05 second exposures, very short exposures. And I've, I've started playing Elite Dangerous a little bit again because they came out with the uh, Odyssey expansion. This seems like a star that might actually be in Elite Dangerous. It's, it's bright enough that it might be in their database. I'm kind of curious now. Because it's modeled on the actual Milky Way galaxy, and there are real stars represented in the game. Even relatively obscure stars like this. Hip six 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 two seven. Is it there? Doesn't seem like it. But it might be listed under a different name. doesn't seem to be. I can check all the names later, but it'd be kind of funny if it were in there. Think about 20 years ago when none of this tech existed. Well, <laughs> that's the ironic thing. Uh, actually, 20 years ago, this tech did exist. Um, <laughs> well, I'm not sure about the AO7. What year did that come out? But I know the telescope and the camera were available at about that time. <sighs> this is quite an old camera. The 2000 XCM... Oops. Yeah, this item is no longer available. That's great, but when did this item become available is the question. Might be okay. It might be newer than I thought. Two thousand six. Really? I'm surprised it's that new. Feels like it should be older. Well, they added a remote guide head on uh, in, in two thousand six, which my my version does have. And the SBIG A07, when did that debut? It was in production in January 1998. Okay, so that's how old some of this equipment is. I remember this sort of setup, maybe not this particular camera, but this sort of setup was sort of the, uh, the, the dream setup, the desire of all of us in the astronomy club in college, when I was in college, my undergrad 20 years ago, um, we all wanted an S-Big camera like this, the university had, uh, an S-Big ST8, I think it was, it wasn't the ST7, I'm pretty sure it was the ST8, and that was considered, you know, high-end, and it was lower resolution than this thing. 
and it was grace you know grayscale that's you know still to this day that's considered a desirable trade having a grayscale deep space camera it's more sensitive and you can throw all the pixels to each color as you filter through a filter wheel um, but yeah I, I remember in college like these types of cameras these were the Cadillacs that we all wanted but couldn't personally afford as poor college students and nowadays you can get this camera on the used market for you know a fraction of its original cost but originally this camera retailed for about the same price as the entire telescope about three thousand dollars give or take and actually the single shot color version of it that I have the uh, 2000 XCM uh, this CCD is the same CCD that's found on the Perseverance and Curiosity rovers in their Z cam the mast cam and the Z cam uh, those cameras use the same CCD and so I thought it was quite poetic back when uh, Perseverance launched that I was able to track it and actually see it leaving Earth with this camera so the same CCD that was on board the vehicle and would eventually start taking pictures on Mars saw the vehicle actually leaving Earth I, I thought that was kinda nice I mean, the pictures I took with my telescope were not nearly as nice as what I was able to get with the iTelescope network, of course, but still, uh, to be able to get that was, was kind of fun. But was the software around back then? Yeah, it probably was. Uh, I'm not going to open up the help menu right now because, again, it doesn't like Windows 10, and any time I start filling with Windows... <laughs> yeah, it was around 20 years ago. CCD Soft version 5 will be provi provided free of charge with all SBEG CCD cameras sold after January 1st, 2001. So there you go. 20 years ago, the software was being distributed with SBEG's cameras. So yeah, it really was intended for use with Windows XP, and it hasn't been maintained. I mean, it's no longer maintained. It's still available for download to users with you know, cameras that have the serial numbers and stuff, but it's not, uh, not state-of-the-art and, and not supported officially at this point. And this camera, you know, the camera's resolution is 1600 by 1200 pixels, that's, that's it. Uh, and, you know, that was high-end back then, 20 years ago, even less than that. Uh, you know, 2006 or whatever, when they were still adding features on this camera. That was considered high-end. And it's still a decent camera. I mean, there's some things that you get with this camera that you just can't get out of an SLR, for example. The thermoelectric cooling. It's running at negative 5 degrees Celsius right now on a warm Florida night. Uh, and it's holding a set temperature. So the calibration image is valid for all the images in terms of temperature it's consistent it's holding a very set temperature and that really does matter even a variation of 10 degrees Celsius really affects things and as you're running a camera if you're just running off a battery or something and it's not controlling its own temperature as the battery heats up it'll heat up the CCD and it just you know it, the temperature varies over the course of the night the atmosphere is cooling off and that can affect it so you have all these variables playing on the temperature of the CCD so the ability for it to actively hold a set point is really useful um, in terms of the calibration. On top of that, the integrated auto guider, it's running off an auto guide chip that is right next to the imaging chip. So it's looking through the same telescope tube to do the auto guiding. And that means you don't have to deal with flexure. It's a huge advantage, in my opinion, especially for a setup like this. The LX200 is a modest telescope. It's a, it's a, it used to be high end. It's not really considered high end anymore. It's a decent telescope, though, but it is mass-produced, and the, the motors and the drives on it are not super accurate for long-duration exposures. Even with periodic error correction, there's still a lot of um, drift there in the motors and, and just issues that come up uh, with auto regular auto-guiding you know, um, 
that can be solved with, say, the AO7, the tilt-tip mirror system that it's designed to work with. That system won't work with an SLR. It'll only work with an S-Big camera of this type from this generation, like an ST7, an ST8, an ST10, or an ST2000. These are the cameras that will work with the AO7. Um, they have newer models now for their newer model cameras, but the point is you need an S-Big camera to work with that adaptive optics unit. It bolts directly to the camera and it does a fantastic job. It allows this, this system, this uh, LX200 on a fork mount with just a cheap Mead standard wedge to get these really nice images that frankly this, this rig has no business doing. It's got no business <laughs> taking images that produce stars that are this pinpoint. You see these little pinpoint stars around the comet. That tells you the system's working really well. It's keeping the stars perfectly centered and perfectly tracked. And the only reason it's able to do that is because of the AO7 and the integrated um, guide chip that's built into the camera. So it's got some really nice features that work really well for a relatively cheap telescope. If you've got a better telescope mount or a wide field refractor, you don't have to be as demanding in terms of the auto guiding. It can be a little more uh, lax in terms of how fast the response time is and things, and you can get away with that. But at this focal length, with you know a two meter focal length telescope even with a 0.63 focal reducer it's very demanding there's really no room for error but with this AO7 I can I can track it full two meters focal length I don't have to have the focal reducer on there it'll run just fine at f10 with no focal reduction and keep everything perfectly pinpoint which is amazing yeah exactly thermally stabilized is huge integrated auto guiding is huge I mean, the fact is, this was top of the line 20 years ago, and although it's lower quality by today's standards and what you can get in terms of megapixels and all the rest, it will always take the same quality of images it always took, you know, which were considered acceptable, in fact, high-end 20 years ago. In fact, I just recently put a print up on my wall, a um, little hat tip to artisan prints uh, that did it out, I think, in, I think they're in New Mexico, Arizona, somewhere out west. But they, they printed a transparency for me of the Orion Nebula taken with this camera. And I've got a nice big, you know, 20-inch print up on my wall, backlit, that looks brilliant, in my opinion, um, sitting up on my wall now, thanks to uh, this camera. So, yeah, I, I really like uh, doing backlit prints now. They're very, very expensive to do, but... Uh, if you get a really nice image that you want to display and make it look the way it does on the screen, really represent the um, sort of the light quality of what the telescope's detecting um, and have something that really uh, shines, literally shines in your room. Um, a backlit print can do that for you. Uh, and so I, I really like that as a strategy for printing deep sky pictures like this where you want a, a galaxy or a nebula and stars to really literally shine and, and cast illumination in the room. Uh, you can get an LED backlight and a transparency print. And so um, Artisan, artisan uh, I think Artisan Prints, something like that, they, they do a really good quality uh, job with that. Have I done any solar imaging? Yeah, uh, I mean, I was obviously I did the 2017 total eclipse. I shot that from Wyoming with this telescope and a, just a white light filter and a Canon T5i. Um, I've done a little bit of hydrogen alpha work with a, a Coronado PST. I've sold that off now. I would like to get at some point a uh, cork eyepiece for some hydrogen alpha work. I've got an 80, 80 millimeter uh, achromat refractor, not exactly you know super high quality stuff, but the advantage of doing hydrogen alpha, of course, is that you're not having to bring multiple wavelengths of light to focus, so it actually doesn't matter that it's an achromat. Uh, you can get away with that because you're only looking at a narrow band source of light. Um, so eventually, I would like to get like a, a quark eyepiece for that thing and uh, do some more hydrogen alpha work. Had to stack it a bunch, though. Oh, yeah, like, the which one? The Orion Nebula? Definitely had to stack it a bunch. I mean, that's three hours of light stacked. 
that sucker is like, yeah, three hours of light, which is actually not all that much. I could go much longer than that if I really had the patience for it. Um, but yeah, that was a that was a pretty significant stack for me. I had uh, I actually did an HDR on it with some short exposures, 30 seconds long, but then a bunch of five minute exposures, and it came out really well. I was I was quite satisfied with it. Oh yeah, these days with mobile phones, uh, you can t you can do a, a disgusting amount. I say disgusting because it's like, you know, I spent uh, a significant amount of money on this rig right here, and and a lot of time figuring out the right camera combination to work with it. And yet I can take my my Google Pixel Four and stick it on just a cell phone mount to an eyepiece, throw throw that in the telescope, and still get a picture that is a decent image of the Orion Nebula. Not as good as, I would argue, not as good as what this can do, even though the resolution's lower, the quality is better, but the cell phone with night vision mode, and really astrophotography mode, especially on the, on the uh, Pixel 4, if you get it mounted properly on a tracking telescope, which, by the way, I've tested this, and I, I've been meaning to do a video about it, I've tested it even on a Nexstar, Nexstar 4, $400 telescope, and it, it's still able to see the Ring Nebula, it's still able to see M82, you know, you, you can see all these galaxies and stuff with a cell phone and a cell phone adapter on a wide field eyepiece and get a decent image that you can at least show your friends and have fun with. I wouldn't argue that it's at the same level as what we're doing right now, but, I mean, chances are it could probably see the comet. I could probably see the comet with the, with the pixel if I if I threw a cell phone mount uh, adapter on there and stuck it on the eyepiece and stuck it on there, it'll do a, like a five minute long stack of images, and it's amazing how much it actually picks up. Again, I would argue not as high quality as this, even though the resolution is technically better. There's certain losses that are just intrinsic in doing that kind of rig, where you're passing the light through an eyepiece and more glass is usually not better. Throwing more glass in the way usually makes more trouble. So having even a high quality Plossel or a, I don't know, a Nagler or some other eyepiece in there in the, in the train is just going to muddy things up more than it should. Uh, you know, this is all prime focus photography here. We're not using an eyepiece. It's just the camera's adapted directly to the back of the telescope, or in this case with a focal reducer, but minimizing the glass in the way is key. Nevertheless, even with just a standard cell phone adapter and a Pixel 4 and turning on astrophotography mode and letting it run for five minutes, as long as this is mounted securely and as long as the telescope is tracking decently enough, it'll produce a very nice image that you can share with your friends. And you could even post on social media, and you'll probably get tons of kudos for it. Um, so yeah, you can you can have a lot of fun and go to town these days with what you already have in your pocket. You may not have even bought it for the astrophotography mode, but guess what? You have in your pocket now a camera, and basically, really, it's it's more because of the computing power of the phone and the ability to stack on board the phone without you even having to worry about installing software, figuring out how to, how to do stacking. It's doing it in the phone for you. Um, you have a tool in your pocket that is better, I would, it, it's not even arguable, way better 
than the starter CCD camera uh, that I started out with um, 15 years ago getting into digital astrophotography. Uh, I had a Mead DSi, the original Mead DSi, uh, which was a single shot color camera, 64480 type resolution. Real basic stuff, but it, it was just enough to dip my toes and get my feet wet and start to learn how to work with FITS files. Uh, the raw image format that is typical in astronomy and it's the same image format that this camera uses so it was a good way to get get interested and get learning uh, get get to learning on how to do digital last photography because it's very different than film uh, there's a lot of differences there and one of the one of the first bits of that learning curve is learning how to work with high bit depth images these are 16 bit uh, images um, on each of the color channels and, and so learning how to work with that, learning how to manually, uh, well not manually, but you know, go through the processing uh, of debayering the images and, and doing all of that. Um, there's a lot of steps there you have to learn because the camera is sending raw data to the computer. The FITS file is, is very raw. Your typical consumer camera like your SLR will do the debayering process for you. You do have the option of doing like a, a, a raw image on an SLR these days, usually. But your, your JPEG, if you save it as a JPEG, for example, what you're used to working with, if you're just doing sort of amateur shooting, is typically going to ha have the debayering process already done for you. Even if you're doing raw, you're usually not fooling around with that stuff um, for most photography types. But when you get to astrophotography, you, you get down to a level where you're working with very raw data that hasn't been altered by the camera or processed in any way. And so you have to learn those processing steps yourself and the best way to handle it for purposes of uh, astrophotography. So anyway, the Mead DSi was a very good way of introducing me to that, to the, some of those concepts. Um, and this was, you know, back in 2004, 2005. Um... And I remember I, I got that thing as soon as it came out, and it had problems. The very first version they released had problems. They just sent me another one because the the IRR filter that came built into it was susceptible to breaking almost right away. Um, anyway, uh, that camera is far inferior to the phone I have in my pocket now. And most people have you know a phone now that can do that kind of thing that is better than the deep the, the dedicated deep space camera I bought, you know, 15 years ago. Granted it was an entry level camera, but still it's it's amazing what technology is advanced to now. And yeah, it's it's very true. Um, there's good YouTube videos on phone astrophotography now. Yeah, definitely. And I I'm amazed at what you can do with phone astrophotography whether with a telescope or without, just with the, you know, the built-in lens, you can do a lot of fun wide-field stuff, but with a telescope, you can really have a lot of fun there, too, getting into uh, higher focal-length astrophotography. best way to do astrophotography is with a pinhole box and 35mm film. I I never quite did that. I did a pinhole camera for watching a solar eclipse. Gosh, this must have been about 20 years ago. There was a partial solar eclipse on Christmas. Bonus points to the first person in the chat who tells me the year. I can't even tell you the year off the top of my head, but I remember going out my, mem my recollection is I went out Christmas morning with this pinhole camera box to be able to project a tiny image of the sun um, using this pinhole it's not wasn't a camera but this pinhole in a box to, to project an image of the sun on the opposite side of the box and, and seeing you know uh, the moon partially covering the sun on Christmas Day um, yeah I mean that was before I had a solar filter or anything for the telescope I had a telescope but, but not uh, not a solar filter for it yet
Oh, you got a you got a Instagram page there, at Raybot. Okay, yeah, I'll definitely have to check that out later. Astro Raybot. Yeah, I'm curious to see what you uh, have been able to accomplish with the phone. <clears throat> it is it is rather amazing what you can do these days. I honestly use my phone now for wide field shots more than my SLR when it comes to wide field astrophotography. It's just easier than dealing with the hassle of the SLR <laughs> because uh, because the phone is doing onboard stacking with the, with the night vision mode or the astrophotography mode really um, it's it doing the work for me that I would normally have to download from the SLR open it in deep sky stacker go through that hassle spend you know 20 minutes doing that or the phone can just do it for me onboard done done ready to share and it's done and honestly the results look every bit as good if not better than my T5i it's incredible now again when it comes to doing <coughs> high quality astrophotography through the telescope tracking a comet like this you know I'd much rather use the S big camera uh, it's a much better solution and will produce better quality pictures not as high resolution but better quality but you can definitely get into it with just your phone. So anyway, yeah, I feel like we've gotten onto a discussion here tonight about <laughs> cameras and telescopes once again. I feel like that's a recurring theme on this channel, but hey, it's all good. I'm having fun. I hope you guys are as well. I heard some rumors that Nibiru was supposed to be visible tonight. I haven't seen it. You see the normal stars and constellations and the moon... But, uh, you know, I am uh, open and willing to examine any evidence, if anyone has any, of Nibiru or Planet X, if anyone has any coordinates they want to toss in the chat for me to point out. I'm happy to go hunt for their, their wild goose. But barring that, uh, we'll hunt a real solar system object, this comet, so... For those of you joining late, we're hunting and looking at, actually, uh, Comet C2020-T2 Palomar. That's what the mouse cursor is pointing out right now. It's a fuzzy little object moving from left to right in each image. In fact, the next image will be coming in in five seconds. So look for that. As soon as that blue bar fills all the way up, it will download the image. And here it comes. So as soon as this new image comes in, you'll see that Comet move just a little bit from left to right. There it goes. Just a very slow, gradual motion. Yeah, it's not even worthy of discussion. I'd agree, Renee. But, again, I am not closed to uh, evidence. I'm always open for evidence, and if anyone has any evidence that is worth looking at, I'll look at it. Even if it's not worth looking at, I'll look at it anyway. Uh, you know. If anyone thinks they can prove it, by all means, go for it. But, in lieu of that, we'll continue looking at this comet. Can I point at it? It's right where the mouse cursor is. I don't know if you can see. I'll move my mouse cursor here a little bit. It's right where that is pointing. That is the comet. 
that little bright fuzzy thing there. And we're running three minute exposures here so we can pick up as much of the comet as possible in each exposure without going so long as to motion blur the comet. So, anyone got any exciting plans for this weekend? Oh, thank you, Quaid man. Appreciate it. Hmm, a little ant deciding to crawl across my screen here. I guess that's the hazard of doing this outside. But how it goes. Kind of wishing I didn't have a one minute lag time between what I say and you guys actually hearing it, but uh, again, that was in case a certain space denier actually showed up and wanted to have a discussion. Well, it seemed like they were willing to have a discussion about my footage supposedly being fake. Again, probably not worthy of discussion, is it? But I got nothing to hide. You want to come on and prove that to my audience that I'm faking all this? Go for it. Let's see it. Let's see some proof. I'm literally showing the uh, software working in real time here. We're seeing the guide star, you know, at high frame rate here, 10 hertz guiding, working, and uh, the resulting images. I can show you guys the telescope on webcam. It's real. But, you know, strangely, when when he found out the offer was not just to come in the live chat and harass me, but actually to come on the stream and talk to me. Well, that changed the situation. I don't know what it is about space deniers and flat earth types that uh, get real bold in live chats, but the moment you ask them, come on the stream. I mean, I'm harmless. I'm not going to curse at you and yell at you. I'll, I'll have a civil discussion with you. I keep things... PG around here, as you guys know. In fact, it's more like enforced civility around here, at least on this channel. But, uh, you know, despite that, hmm, no, not not interested the moment the uh, offer is to actually be on stream. Hmm. Ooh, catch some sunspots? Yeah, that sounds like fun. I've had bad luck. Speaking of solar observing, I've had bad luck lately trying to track ISS transits uh, across the sun. The last couple times I've tried, clouds have come over just seconds to maybe a minute before the space station was going to cross the sun and completely block my view. Completely. It's happened twice in a row now, on days that were pretty much sunny throughout. 
But no, that one moment that I needed to be clear so I can see the space station in front of the sun. Uh-uh, can't have that. <laughs> Somebody will claim that's a conspiracy, I'm sure. But no, I've done some direct tracking instead. You can see a video that I just posted on my channel a couple days ago of uh, tracking the space station this past weekend. And you can see uh, the Crew 2 Dragon docked to the station. I'm, I'm quite proud of that. Um, it's not the best footage I've ever captured of the space station. It was only 51 degrees over horizon, I think. So, not the best conditions, but decent. Decent enough. You can see the gaps in the solar panels. You can see the habitat sections. If you know where to look real closely, you can even see the uh, beam uh, activity module, the, the inflatable, expandable, uh, expanded uh, module that was attached to the space station, if you know right where to look. Um, and, of course, you can see Dragon docked to it. But uh, here, in a couple weeks, I should get another opportunity. June 6th, I believe. So if the weather is good, it's supposed to be like a direct overhead pass, basically. Um, it's coming out of the northwest in the evening, so the sun angle isn't ideal for that when it's rising. Uh, you want the sun to be opposite the sky, or, you know, on the opposite side of the sky from the station, ideally, so that the, the sun rays are reflecting off the solar panels instead of passing through the solar panels. Because when it's passing through the solar panels, it has really dark amber color. It's really nice, I mean, it's pretty, but it's hard to see the solar panels harder than when it, it's reflecting off the solar panels. Uh, and you get these really wide... Uh, um, this really wide divergence and dynamic range between the very bright, reflective habitat modules of the space station and the radiators of the space station versus the amber, the deep amber solar panels when the sunlight is passing through the panels. But when the sunlight's reflecting off the panels and the sun is on the opposite side of the sky from the station, it's a lot easier to image the panels at fast exposure and get the whole station at fast exposure without blowing anything out and get better details. That's that's how I got my best ever footage of the station during Crew 1, uh, when it was actually on the opposite side, starting to get on the opposite side of the sky from the sun, after it uh, passed the, um, the peak of the pass. Uh, but the trouble with the with a straight overhead pass is that the telescope in altitude azimuth mode can't keep up with it past the zenith. Um, because basically the telescope, when it sees it rising, it can follow it straight up, it's just tilting straight up on its altitude azimuth configuration, which is where it's most stable. If it's on the wedge, if it's polar aligned, it's more susceptible to vibration, uh, which is not good when you're trying to, you know, track something moving uh, at, you know, at one degree per second, screaming through the sky, basically. Um, as it's rising, it only has to basically tilt up, and it's got to move in almost one axis altitude azimuth to track it, but as soon as it hits the zenith, the highest point in the sky, now it's setting, now the telescope's got to spin 180 degrees, and it can't do that instantly. It does it at 8 degrees per second maximum with my telescope, so, you know, do the math there. It's going to take you over, uh, what, 22 seconds, 23 seconds to, to get over there to turn around completely, and by that point, the station's already much lower in the sky. So, you can polar align, which I might do for this next pass. I might risk that, because although it's more susceptible to vibration, it doesn't have to move as high speed to keep up, because it can track through the zenith without having to completely spin around. I mean, ideally, what you really want to do is you want to get a polar alignment wedge, but you want to align um, parallel with the ISS uh, orbital uh, axis, essentially, so that the equatorial axis, or equatorial direction of the telescope is parallel with the IS, the space station's uh, orbital plane. I mean, that would be the most ideal way to do it, but not really what the telescope was designed to do. So, that's, uh, that's the trick. So I may try to polar align track it so that I can track it through the zenith because getting it after the zenith, getting it just after the zenith, 
when it's on now on the opposite side of the sky from the sun is where the panels are really going to shine the best. My alternative then, if I don't want to do that, is to alt as track it and maybe only start tracking it just after the zenith. Uh, starting the scope pointing straight up and starting to track it at that point, but it'll take me a few seconds to lock onto it. And at that point, you know, you might be missing out on the best moments. So, it's a real catch-22, and I'm still debating in my head how best to handle it. I've never tried to track the Space Station Polar Line before, but it might be worth it. On the other hand, my tracking software is also completely untested in a Polar Line configuration, and I'm pretty sure there's some bugs I need to squash. So, that's going to be my weekend, is, is actually working on some of, some of that software-wise. Uh, trying to better test and, and work out any issues potentially with uh, polar align tracking with Sat Tracker. So if you join as a channel member, you get free exclusive access to compiled executables of Sat Tracker and Rocket Tracker, um, my software that I developed for tracking the space station and tracking rocket launches. Uh, so to catch up on some questions in the chat, what type of telescope do I have? So. Oh, and it's not fake is real. What's fake is their page. Oh, okay. Well, anyway. Um, the telescope is an 8-inch LX200 Classic on an equatorial wedge, just the Mead standard wedge on the Mead standard tripod. Polar aligned, so it's polar aligned. And uh, the camera is an S-Big ST2000 XCM. And I'm also using an A07 adaptive optics unit uh, guiding at 10 hertz. So it's making 10 corrections per second with the tilt tip mirror to compensate for the atmosphere and any any drive uh, tracking errors. And we're looking at Comet C2020 T2 Palomar. Long period comet in a 5,000 year orbit, uh, or about a 5,500 year orbit really, uh, which will be reaching closest approach to the sun in July at a distance of two astronomical units from the sun. It's currently about 1.42. <coughs> 1.42 astronomical units from Earth, or about 1.42 times the distance to the Sun from Earth. And so that is the object you see the mouse cursor pointing at right here. Oh, you ordered a Celestron HD Edge 9.25. Well, that should be nice. Very similar to what I have. A little bit bigger, actually. Yeah, and it seems like everything, telescope-wise, is back-ordered and just difficult to get these days. It's crazy. Um, it reminds me, I need to put in an order for a Celestron uh, power adapter. Seems like one of them is uh, currently having issues. Uh, when I went out and tracked... Well, actually, Red's Rhetoric did the tracking, really. Uh, but when I went out to help him film uh, that last Starlink launch last weekend, his power adapter uh, wasn't working. Fortunately, I had an identical power adapter for my next star with me, so I just swapped it out, and that worked just fine. But from some suppliers, that even that power adapter is backward. It's like, come on, really? It's nuts. Uh, 
I would not want to be in the market for a new telescope right now, though. Just in terms of supply chain issues, it's it's so bad right now. I'm assuming it's mainly because of microchip suppliers being overtasked. I, I don't know what's really driving it, but it's it's bad out there. definitely tell the telescope is past the meridian now and the comet is decreasing in altitude pointing out towards the west a little bit now yeah, I should take a take a long exposure shot of the telescope itself with the uh, cell phone camera here <laughs> that's the nice thing about it just have it in your pocket it's fully capable of really nice long exposure shots. There we go. Let's see how that does. Take a three minute exposure with my cell phone of the telescope as it's taking a three minute exposure of the comet. <laughs> the upper part getting brighter? Could be. Looking at the moon, it looks like there might be a little more haze than there was earlier in the evening. More of, more of a glow, just a diffuse glow around the moon, and even the moon itself looks a little fuzzy by eye. And if it's getting hazier, it's going to diffuse the light of the moon more over the comet. Incidentally, the uh, picture I'm taking of the telescope does not appear to have the moon in the field of view. Can't really tell just how bad it is, but by eye, just looking at the moon, I can see quite a glow around it. Hey, Andrew. Good to see you. So, yeah, Jorge, you may be, you may be seeing it truly getting a little brighter there in the middle. It's just stray moonlight affecting the image. For that reason, just because of how bright the moon is tonight, it's not uh, not the most ideal night to do this, but uh, it's fun anyway. Yeah, no problem, Andrew. I didn't really give much warning that I'd be doing this tonight. 
I wasn't entirely sure if the weather was going to obey the forecast or not. Kind of wanted to hang out and wait and see till after work, um, just what the weather was going to do tonight. But sure, sure has remained clear as promised. So, going for it. I'm going for it. It's been a while since I've done a deep space live stream. So, to heck with the moon. I'm doing it anyway. Okay, that is one picture complete. Yeah, you can tell just in the picture like how milky the sky is just from all the moonlight. Looks like the corner of the laptop is just on the right side of the image there. It's not perfect, but uh, that's fine. Alright, I'm going to download that onto the computer here and then share it on the stream just so you guys can see the, the telescope right now. So there, move this out over to this side. You can see the uh, telescope there from just a moment ago as it's taking these images. Oh, thank you, Andrew. Two dollar super chat from Andrew Kroll. Need to do this more often. Need space. Yeah, I agree. Let me see if I can get another shot here. Maybe this time I can try to get the moon in the frame as well. I'm not sure if I can. Well. Let me scoot. I'm just propping it up on the microphone as my makeshift tripod stand of sorts. There we go. Alright, just barely fit the telescope on one side and the moon on the other so you can get an idea of the amount of light we're facing.
Hey, notice those five and six stars almost line up straight on the middle right. Are you talking about the telescope image or the, well, okay, the image from the telescope or the image of the telescope? I mean, yeah, there's a there's a nice line of stars uh, up here, if that's what you're seeing. Or do you mean the image of the telescope? Oh, Jorge joined as a member. Thank you, Jorge. Normally I would have been awake, but I got my second Pfizer shot seven hours ago and they told me to rest. Yeah, definitely get some rest. So the images of the telescope, I notice, do have some significant uh, lens flares and reflections in them. Let me show you sort of an, an example of what I mean. So here's the latest image of, of the telescope. And you can see the moon on the, on the far right side. What you can also see is a series of like four stars right in a line. It looks like the white tube of the telescope is pointing to it. That's the Achromat refractor. I keep that piggy back on top as a counterbalance uh, just for weight balance issues. But the four dots you see on in the sky there, uh, that's actually a reflection of the neighbor's porch lights down there. That's what that is. It's a reflection on the opposite side of the image from those those porch lights. They're not actually in the sky. I, looking by eye, I can't see that at all, but that, that's consistent with the, the line of four bright uh, garage lights on the neighbor's houses. So that, that's actually what you're seeing there. It's artifactual. Looks nice, though.
Nice damage. Alright. So we probably got a couple dozen images in total. However, we had that interruption with the guider that will, you know, muck up my attempts at a time lapse. I kind of want to let it run a little longer um, to make up for that fact. But let me uh, run to the desktop real quick, quick and uh, process what we've collected so far uh, post guider issue at the beginning and um, make a little time lapse clip I can show on stream just to show how much the comet has moved uh, since we started. So I'll be right back. Well, I've made a critical error. Oh dear. Okay, so basically we haven't been saving any of the images that have been collected other than on stream. Well, that's a shame. Huh. <laughs> okay. We start again. Yikes. I forgot to turn on autosave. Oh. What have I done? Oh, I don't want to think about the fact that I just lost an hour's worth of images. Oh. Well. <laughs> Good news, it's still running, so I can 
take these images and save them this time. <sighs> Bottom line is I have no time lapse to present because I have no images saved. Oh, always, always, always check. Alright, let me try to figure out how much time I have left on this comet before I lose it. It's 65 degrees altitude right now. It's almost 1 a.m. right now. If I go to 4 a.m., I'm at 26 degrees altitude. Yikes. Okay, well, again, I apologize. I have effectively lost the data from earlier in the evening. <sighs> Other than, I mean, the fact we got to see it on stream live, which is nice, but... Not really usable for making a time lapse, because these images that you're seeing here are just a portion of the... Um, total dynamic range that the camera's capturing, and they're, it, they're not really cleaned up properly. This is just, you know, raw, quick look at the images. So, I guess, you know, bottom line is, I got two and a half hours longer until the comet hits the trees, maybe, maybe, just eyeballing it and guessing. Yeah, mistakes were made. Mistakes were made. At least I had the lens cover off so I didn't spend an hour wondering why all the pictures are black. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm not going to lose too much sleep over it. We got to enjoy it here together on the live stream, if nothing else. Um, but I would like to capture something, you know, of a time lapse. If I get, you know, two hours, maybe two and a half hours worth of images, I should get about 50 images of the comet to put into a time lapse. I mean, that's decent. Yeah, it would have been nice to have another 20 that I just lost, but... I can still work with it. I can still work with it. Um, so, let me go check. I'm going to compare the focus between the images I'm collecting right now and the initial images before the initial guider issue. I did save those images. They're not going to be useful for the time lapse because they're too far apart. But I can at least do an A-B comparison of the focus and make sure uh, that I don't need to go refocus the scope right now. So, I'll be right back.
Okay, so glass half full. I'm gonna I'm gonna call it glass half full here. Um, first of all, the focus looks just as good as it did before, so I, I think I'm good there. Secondly, because the moon is now lower in the sky, it is definitely throwing less light into the image. Um, atmospheric attenuation is working in my favor. So the image I'm getting now of the comet looks like it has a better contrast between the comet and the background sky <laughs> excuse me, the background sky from less moonlight I mean it's still pretty pretty bright from the moonlight but um, nevertheless I think I'm getting a better image of the comet now than I was an hour ago so I'm glad I caught it when I did but it's, it's, not, all for, it's not all for not at this point we're going to keep collecting images here, we're going to keep this thing running as long as I can and at the end, I think we still will have a, a time-lapse video to show for it. It'll just be one that started at 1 a.m. instead of, you know, midnight. I mean, yeah, the software... It's, it's my... Again, this was a pepcac. This was, this was my fault. I should have turned autosave back on. I, I generally try to triple check that because this is what I want to avoid. But, you know, of all the things to miss out on, this isn't this isn't so bad because we can still recover from this. Um, hey, Bob the Science Guy, great to see you here. What's your favor? Ask away. Happy to help. And I hope you have a good night, Sheila. Um, appreciate you coming by. Hope you enjoyed it. Yes, I've got uh, software to track satellites. I wrote Sat Tracker, uh, which I think it's actually in the in the video description here already for GitHub for the source code on that. Uh, and yeah, so I've uh, just recently done some tracking of ISS, and you can check out that footage. What can I help you with? Need me to track something? For as oh, you mean ASCOM? Yes, it's it should be ASCOM compatible. Though admittedly, I've done less testing on ASCOM than the LX200 command set. But yes, yeah, ASCOM. It is it is uh, it does support ASCOM as long as your scope supports the move access method through ASCOM. A subset of drivers will do that. Uh, Celestron's universal driver will do that for more recent Nexstar scopes. If it's a really old Nexstar, it may not, but for most Nexstars, it should work. Yeah, I'm shooting uh, Comet C2020 T2 Palomar. But yeah, if you want to collab together on uh, tracking some stuff with ASCOM, I'm 
happy to help if there's any issues with uh, using um, Sat Tracker. Again, it should work, um, but I've only tested it a couple times with ASCOM in the field. Um, Yeah, go ahead and try it out on your system. What what kind of uh, scope will you be using it with? Please don't say EQ mod. Please don't say EQ mod. <laughs> I say that because people have reported issues with EQ mod, and I've tried to use their emulator, and I can't make heads or tails of what the heck is going on error-wise. I should take another crack at that sometime, because I would really like to make it work with EQ mod. But I, I don't know. It's like EQ mod is not responding the way that Celestron does. In theory, if it works on one, it should work on both, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Oh, thank you, Bob. I swear I heard something on four legs right behind me. We got bobcats out here. EQ mod. I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I could try to make it work on EQ mod again. I should take another crack at that. And honestly, if I if I have if I have someone's help to you know test that out on hardware and give me feedback, maybe we can troubleshoot it together and get it working if you want to. Um, you could try it as is, I just, I've heard reports it won't work with EQ mod. But, you know, as you can see, as everyone else can see, EQ, EQ mod is very popular, so um, it'd be nice to be able to make it work with that. I mean, I'd almost be willing, because it, it's so popular, I'd almost be willing to try to do some sort of direct communications protocol instead of through ASCOM if that were an option. Um, for EQ mod, if that's what it would take. But honestly, it ought to work with ASCOM. I just don't understand why it's acting the way it's acting on some things. It's acting like it won't respond to certain commands that it should be responding to. So. Need a gem for the 10 inch mead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's tricky, man, to, to get a 10 inch Schmidt Cassegrain to track accurately enough to do really good work. Uh, you know, long exposure tracking and, and uh, deep space tracking, things like that. I mean, the only reason this works as well as it is right now is because of the AO7, which is making up for the fact that the 
you know, classic LX200 mount is kind of not good enough for this. Um, but it, it works well with the A07. Oh, oh, you were kidding about the EQ mod. Oh, oh. Oh, sorry, I, I see now. You use a Mead and PMC-8. What's a PMC-8? I should know what that is. Oh, it's a Explore Scientific Mount? Is that what it is? Oh, huh. Interesting. I hadn't seen that one before. Okay. Well, that might work. I don't know much about the PMC-8. But yeah, just let me know if you want to test it out. If you have any issues, uh, let me know, um, and I'll, I'll hook you up. We'll get it going. Been doing a lot of work with uh, Red lately on remote rocket tracking, and had some good success last time on that. Um, and we did some more revisions to it as a result of that, actually, because it seems like SpaceX rounds there. T zero times to the nearest minute. If it's just like a Starlink launch, they don't necessarily uh, tweet out the time down to the second, and that leads to issues when you're trying to initiate predictive launch tracking based on the T zero time in a computer clock. So, Exos two, huh? Oh, I see. With PMC-8 go to electronics. Oh, okay. So that's the electronics set that's on it. Okay. Huh. I do not know... Not I do not know much about that mount. And I have no earthly idea if it even supports the move access method. Like a Nexstar would. But... That's interesting. It looks like they're running... Serial cables to each of the motors? Hmm. Anyway, I mean, it, it could, maybe, sort of. I, I don't know. I don't know if it'll support the right command set to uh, work with my software, because my software depends on, for ASCOM, it depends on directly setting the drive rates so it can specify exactly how quick to turn to track the satellite. Um, but not all mounts that support ASCOM will actually support that method. So, for example, ironically, even my own LX200 will not support that method. So I can't use the ASCOM. You know, Mead does, of course, have ASCOM drivers, but I can't use ASCOM uh, when using my own satellite tracking software with it. I have to directly talk to the scope in LX200 language because that's the only way I can get it to turn at the right rates. Um, and I can look into Exos to... Uh, the PMC-8 command set. I wonder if they allow you to directly set it through their programmer's reference. There we go. I wonder if they allow you to directly set the drive rates through their own command set. Oh, wow. They show you the boards and everything. MIM tests. Oh, well, they're using EEPROMs. That's pretty... Typical, that's what the LX200 uses. Uh, let's see what is explore, sci explore scientific command language interpreter as com platform functions. Uh, explore stars app astronomy calculations display. Explore stars app communications functions. Commands wire through serial or wireless communications. Okay. Hmm. 
custom rate C calculation rate value okay this like tracking rates but what if I want to set a slew rate It's a very detailed document. Oh yeah, and the other issue with that with a gem is you gotta worry about meridian and flips. That's something I never have to worry about with the fork arm. Hmm. steps per second so you could do that well that's interesting simple base PMC 8 commands deal with the root motor control features and allow you to start and stop each motor and set the speed micro step and direction values interesting let me bookmark this thing Well, if they allow you to set the drive rates directly, I don't know what the limits are. I don't know what the maximum slew speed's like or anything. That's going to, of course, determine how easy this is to do. But if it's letting you... directly set the rates... Strings. Oh, you gotta send hex strings? Is that what you gotta do? Well, that's easy enough, I guess. Yeah. I'll have to spend more time with it, but it should be possible, theoretically, to code a driver for it directly in my software, talk to it in its own language, assuming it won't work with the ask comment, and maybe it will, but I hesitate just because I'm not familiar with it. It may or may not. But it may be possible to code something that will directly talk to the PMC-8 and um, command the drive rates directly. Yeah, smooth motion. Yeah, I mean, I've got smooth motion working with my LX200. Um, classic. I've heard there are issues with that sometimes with the more recent ones. Certainly, direct drive rate command on the newer LX200 is the command language for LX200 is garbage these days. It only lets you set it to the nearest tenth of a degree per second. Come on, give me more precision than that, need. But um, four degrees per second on the PMC8 or with the uh, with that mount, that should do it. I mean, that's the same drive speed that I've got with the Next Star, and that works. So, and Andrew's already on it. He's he's got the deets on it. Yeah, it should be possible. Then it sounds like they let you directly go in there and set that, unless that's unless I'm reading on something that's actually some sort of intermediary box. As long as I can directly set that with these commands that they're talking about. and allow me access to the room motor control, I mean... Okay, you must enter diagnostic mode to enable the base commands. The firmware is set to continuously display the auto-guided port values. The command interpreter will still process the base commands when entered. Okay... I'm not sure what they mean by diagnostic mode or what that entails, but... If it will let me directly set the the micro steps per second, and it's pretty simple to just do the conversion on that and and be able to directly set drive rates.
George Dudash LX200 auto start. Oh, the auto start, yeah. Uh, the Eclipse is, what, the 26th, I think? It's coming up. So the adaptive optics, uh, the S Big A07. I can sh shoot a link into the chat on that. Um, it's a tilt tip mirror system, and uh, it works, you know, exclusively with S Big cameras. Uh, this is an older model. In fact, this I think is their first model they introduced in the 90s. Um, yeah, here's a. Here's a page on it. <laughs> it looks as old as the camera itself. Um, so this just gives some background. It's just a tilt-tip mirror system. And it can guide up to, I think, 40 hertz. I'm running at 10 hertz right now. Dear Lord, please tell me I did turn on autosave this time. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, so I'm running at uh, 0.05 second exposures, 10 hertz, almost 11 hertz. Um, and it's able to respond much, much faster than the drives are. So I don't have to worry about any declination backlash or anything like that. Um, when it reaches the limit of travel of the tilt, it will use the telescope's motors to steer the star back into the range that the, the mirror can handle. Um, but the mirror is responding much faster than the drives are and, you know... Uh, it just uh, enables pinpoint stars where the mount wouldn't be adequate for that. And really, the mount, my mount, the you know the Alex Tundra Classic mount on a standard Mead wedge, is not really adequate for that. Um, particularly because of the backlash issues. But because of the A07, I'm able to get you know relatively pinpoint stars. Yeah, the comet's right here. This is a C2020 uh, T2 Palomar. So we're watching it slowly moving in these three minute exposures. The camera is taking uh, three minute exposures while the telescope tracks the stars and the comet is slowly moving from left to right in the image. And eventually, hopefully at the end of the night, I'll have enough useful images to be able to put together a bit of a time lapse of that.
Andrew with the bad cow pun joke. That's funny. <laughs> a joke so so bad Andrew it went right over people's heads it's okay well that's good to hear Bob I, I look forward to seeing your stream of the eclipse you're gonna you're over on the west coast you'll have a better view of it than I will that's for sure We're watching uh, Comet C-2020 T2 Palomar. It's currently about 1.42 astronomical units from Earth, and it will be reaching closest approach to the Sun at about 2 astronomical units from the Sun uh, in July of this year. And the comet is where you see the mouse cursor. It's moving slowly from left to right. We're running three minute images. In fact, one is about to complete right about now. And as soon as it downloads, you'll see the image update, and you'll see the comet has shifted very, very slightly to the right. Michigan. Well, probably still have a better view of it than I will here in Florida. We don't even get to see totality. I'm not sure where, what your situation is going to be in Michigan, but uh, it's going to be pretty tough here. You guys are having rum? Andrew's having rum. I had a Kentucky bourbon ale earlier. Yeah, no problem, Bob. And again, Bob, let me know if you uh, want to collaborate on setting you up with uh, my sat tracking software, maybe writing a specific driver for your hardware if you want.
<laughs> Arizona, where it's clear most nights, except when there's something astronomical happening. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> uh, yeah, this is the first really nice, clear Friday night I've had in a while, so... It's nice to get the scope out and get this running. I'm going to go take another look at the images that I've collected so far, see if I can throw together a quick little time-lapse animation for you guys of what we've collected so far since I started saving the images, and I'll be right back.
Hey gang, sorry, I don't know why the stream went all choppy. Well, actually, I probably do. Uh, it's probably because of, uh, me uploading stuff to my OneDrive. Um, pictures and such. Should be back to normal now. So, I've got a little time-lapse clip of the images so far that have been saved. So there we go. You can see the comet there, moving along. Hopefully that's coming through on the stream okay. Let me turn up the contrast and the brightness. Okay, incidentally, I do want to try to tweak the focus a bit, so after this image, I'm going to throw it back over, uh, I think. Do I really want to do that? Yeah, I kind of do. I just want to be quick about it. So as soon as this last image comes in in 30 seconds, I'm going to stop the imaging real quick. Put up my focusing mask. I'm going to throw it over to Arcturus, refocus the scope as quickly as we can, and then bring it back to the comet. The focus honestly doesn't look too bad, but I was doing some A-B comparisons between this image, or the latest images, and the initial images when I started saving. And you can tell the stars are starting to get a little bigger. Okay.
gonna live dangerously, turn off autosave while I focus. But auto guide, I wanna take a quick quick image. Okay, so that's where we need to put the star back when we're done. Second image. Okay. Let's see those diffraction spikes. It's not too bad, but it could use a little tweak. Okay, I don't know if I'm making it better or worse. I think I'm making it better. Yeah, I think that's good. That looks good enough. Get that guide star back in place as quickly as we can. Okay, let's get that guide star back where it belongs. Didn't mean to maximize that. Come here. I don't want a big gap in the time lapse, so I'm trying to get this thing back where it belongs as quickly as I can. And we just bring it up to the top of the image. A few more seconds. Okay. Bring it over to the right just a skosh. Okay, that's good. Right there. Right there. Okay, let's re engage. Auto save. Alright, let's turn off subframe. We want three minutes. Go.
All right, we're back on target. We refocused on Arcturus, and then quickly tried to get back on the comet. We're just going to track this thing into the trees. So what I zoomed in on there is uh, Arcturus. It's a bright star in the constellation Boötes. I just needed it for focusing. I put a Batinov mask on the front of the telescope. That causes those big diffraction spikes coming off the star. And you want to adjust the focus so that the diffraction spikes are symmetrical. And when they're perfectly symmetrical, you're in perfect focus. So now I've moved it back on the comet and got the guide star back where it should belong and re-engaged the adaptive optics unit, the autoguider, and now we're taking a fresh image of the comet. So hopefully that won't produce too big a hiccup in the ultimate time lapse, but there will be a little bit of a hiccup there where we went off target for a bit and we're not imaging the comet to try to get back in perfect focus. You have to do that occasionally as the telescope tracks, the mirror flops, the temperature as it drops the tube, uh, the metal of the tube will contract, and all of this can throw off your focus. I don't have a carbon fiber tube like some fancy people, so... Here we go, hopefully back on target. <laughs> oh yeah. That looks real good, that looks real good. So you can see the comet right there. That's gonna take a dark frame, get rid of those hot pixels, and then we'll be back to regular imaging on the comet. Yeah, it does look cool with the Batonoff mask. It's really just for a focusing tool, though.
Let's see how it looks with that dark frame subtracted in another 10 seconds. Alt access is super loose and I can't tighten it. Ooh. No, I think you can probably service that yourself. Maybe. I don't know how it is on the newer Auto Stars, but on mine, like, I've taken that whole drive system apart before, so. Um, no, I think you could probably tighten the clutch yourself. I mean, there's really good tutorials out there. There's uh, guys who have tons of experience taking LX 200s apart piece by piece. Ooh, if something's stripped, yeah, that could be tricky, but, I mean... I would I would look into uh, tutorials on how to tear down an LX200 and see what happens when you take it apart see if you can find what's wrong there's probably it's probably an easy fix I would think could be wrong but I bet it's easy a manual cleaning it will kill off the hot pixels is that some sort of baking process because in terms of like cleaning the dust obviously there's a couple dust motes but those are easily corrected with the flat field subtraction scary to pull the tube out yeah I mean if you were completely disconnecting the tube from the fork arms that's pretty scary I've never done that to mine before but I've at least opened up the the, uh, the motors on it uh, both for the deck and for the right ascension and, and looked at those before I forget why. I think I pulled the the clutch knob off the declination before. I could be wrong. I thought I did that before, and I can't even remember why I did it. All right, let's see how long we've got till we hit trees. Hopefully, we got a while. Yeah, I think we got plenty of time. It's far north enough in declination, it won't really hit the trees as quickly as the moon is. <sighs> yeah, as long as you're careful, you should be fine. Just don't drop the tube, but, I mean, I don't think it's as... It's just my opinion, I don't think pulling the tube off the fork arms is as scary an operation as, say pulling the corrector plate out or something. I, I would be scared to death of that just because I've seen horror stories of people dropping their corrector plates and shattering them. But of course, you know, you always hear the horror stories. The successful ones tend to go quiet. So... Don't let worst case scenarios discourage you from doing the repair. That's a good point, Andrew. If a whole strip, just retap it for a larger size. No problem. <laughs> problem solution. I mean, seriously, yeah. Especially if you, I don't know what type of LX200 you have, but if you have a classic like I do. I mean, we're on our own for repairs. You're, you're pretty much on your own. So you might as well do your best to fix it because you're not going to break it any worse than it already is. And honestly, I mean, these things are easily, I would say, pretty easy to repair. I've swapped out motherboards. I've swapped out power panels and cables. I mean... Heck, even, even the hand controller I have is a replacement hand controller. It's a 3D printed third party affair, and it works pretty well.
I mean, you can even completely replace the declination motors on it if you really want. Uh, motor, I guess. I mean, just, just the one, but... You can get replacement motor boards and stuff. I don't... It doesn't sound like that's your issue. It sounds like it's just a clutch issue. I think that's, you know, pretty simple fix mechanically. I, I don't think you're going to run into too much trouble there. Again, I could be totally wrong, but I, I wouldn't hesitate to take a crack at that if I were you. We're looking at Comet C-2020 T2 Palomar. It's the fuzzy object that the mouse cursor is pointing at, and if you look, you'll see it moving from left to right in the images. Oh, for Canon. Yeah, okay, no, that's, that's a... That's a Canon thing. Like, this this camera doesn't have that. Um, that's why the auto-dark process does its thing. The, the It's basically the same thing, I guess, as what a Canon would do in terms of... The Canon takes its own dark frame and internally subtracts it. This camera does very little, basically no onboard processing. It just delivers raw data to the computer, and then the computer software decides what to do with it. So the computer is doing a... a automatic dark subtraction based on a three minute dark frame that it took that took out those hot pixels what you're seeing now are generally not hot pixels you see some cosmic ray strikes but then it's just thermal noise and stuff just regular random noise yeah the ETX acts as the clutch from the tube side of the fork but at least that's just tiny, yeah. Scope's old and tough. I mean, they really built these LX200 Classics really well. I mean, they're just really well built in terms of uh, the ruggedness and how repairable they are for the most part. I mean, they made some foolish missteps, I feel, in terms of the design in some places, like the way it runs at 18 volts, and if you get a power supply that's a little bit dodgy, you could blow a capacitor. Capacitors are tantalum that tend to pop, and when they pop, they can burn the boards, and things like that, but they, you know, capacitors can be swapped out for more reliable units. Um, and that's, that's the big thing that a lot of guys do. I had bought a spare motherboard, which I accidentally burned up, but before I burned it up, it had been um, preemptively repaired with uh, replacement capacitors and stuff. But in general, the mechanics of it, it's really well made. No, it's all right, Renacal. I've got a, I've got a pretty heavy stream delay set on right now, so anything I say is is coming to you a minute after I set it. SV Boney. Why is that the second time this week I've heard that name? SV Boney. Who was, who was telling me about them before? Somebody else brought them up earlier this week. That's the first time I'd heard of them, but they have a dark frame filter you can buy. Dark frame filter? Sure, it's not a flat frame filter or something? I don't know. Like, they make flat frame projectors and stuff. Dark frame filter. Maybe like a. I mean, all the, all you do for dark frame is you cover the CCD. You can cover the front of the telescope, or you can cover the CCD. 
In this case, the camera has its own built-in shutter, just like an SLR would. It's got a physical shutter that closes for the dark frame. So it's all built in and automatic. It doesn't really need anything. Okay, I'm gonna go take a look at these new images. Yeah, we got some... We got some experienced amateur astronomers here. Not just me, I mean people in the chat. Got lots of experience. Just try... No, it's alright, Quaid, man. Appreciate it. I'm just trying to figure out what a dark frame filter could be, but I, I think you're probably referring to a flat frame filter or projector, I'm guessing. Uh, I could be wrong on that, but... Anyway, yeah, no, there's there's tools out there for calibration to help with things like flat fields that are, one of these days would be nice to get some sort of illuminate, uh, some sort of even light illuminator for flat fields. Right now I just use the side of my house. I turn on a light when I'm done for the night. I turn on one of the exterior lights on the house. I point it at the, at the wall and uh, take shots that way. It's, it's somewhat even. It's not really ideal, but it it gets the job done. I take out any residual radiance with processing and the picks in sight and call it good. The main thing is to get the dust motes out on the flat field, even if the result isn't perfectly flat. Yeah, they didn't rate the caps high enough. You overspec by 2x when you design for clients. Yeah, exactly, Andrew. I, I think you're dead on right about that. The, the main complaint about the LX200 is the capacitors just aren't rated high enough, or they're not they're not specced high enough for what they put them through. I think somebody said they spec'd them out for a 12 volt operation, but then they ultimately went with 18 volts, and that's just running too close to the limit. And I, I think you told me that, that electrolytics are worse, and I, I, I don't know all that much about it. I just know there's tantalums and there's electrolytics. And the tantalums are what's built into it, I'm pretty sure. And people say, oh, you got to take those out. You got to replace them with electrolytics. But I, I couldn't tell you the pros and cons of that. Oh, I'm so glad you got a picture of yourself at ISS. I'm so happy to hear that. Especially that I, I helped inspire you, perhaps. That's awesome. I'm so glad. Oh, it's for making dark frames without any leakage. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. I'll, I'll buy that, I guess. I feel like, at least on the S-Big, the shutter works well enough. It doesn't usually suffer leakage issues, but if you do, it's probably you got an issue with your shutter. But, I don't know, maybe, maybe there could be light leaking in from something else. Yeah, man. No, it's it's good to have you here, Quaid, man. I appreciate it. Like I said, I'm going to go run a check on these new images coming in now and see how the focus compares to what it looked like before and, and all that. Maybe, maybe extend the uh, time lapse I did a moment ago uh, with the new images. So I'll be, I'll be right back.
Okay, I don't know how choppy things were there. It probably went choppy because I was doing a lot of OneDrive operations that seems to mess with the, the stream uh, bandwidth. Sorry about that. But it should be, uh, should be back to normal now. Ooh, that's a nice picture of uh, Jupiter with uh, Io and Ganymede shadows at the same time. That's really cool. Uh, all right, uh, let me uh, pull up the new time lapse. So here's the uh, extended time lapse with the latest images now. You can really see that comet moving there. Not too bad. Sorry. Yeah. So here's the time lapse of the the, uh, the extended time lapse with the latest images included. You can really see the comet moving there. If you look on the far left, you'll see a little black bar appear on a few of the frames from the image shifting a little bit after we did the refocus. But uh, not bad. Not bad doesn't seem to cause a major hiccup in terms of the motion of the comet. I mean, if you look real close, you can kind of tell it speeds up a little bit from the minutes we were refocusing. But, uh, no, it's all good. I'm quite happy with how it's coming out. I see. So, if, yeah, both will explode if underrated, but the electrolyte will puke electrolytes all over the board and corrode everything near it. Well, that's worse. Okay, that's worse. Uh, okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, I guess that you're right, then. The main issue is just that it's underrated as it comes stock. Not choppy that time? Okay, I was getting a red light on uh, OBS when I came back from inside. Because I was probably because I was choking up the uh, upstream bandwidth on um, sending the time lapse video onto OneDrive. My up my upstream bandwidth is pretty limited on my home internet, and I'm trying to restrict how much OBS is actually using, so it doesn't uh, so it has plenty of overhead or pl plenty of uh, clearance, but it still gets hit pretty hard when I'm uploading anything else from any other computer. And the Great Red Spot. Yes. Good point. Yeah, it's a great picture. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Well, you got it at the right time. That's cool. I'm, that's cool that you planned that. That worked out. I didn't plan any of this tonight, to, to be honest. I'm just throwing the scope at whatever I feel like tonight. And tonight I feel like throwing it at C2020 T2 Palomar.
Yeah, good moon photography can be tricky. I mean... You can have a pretty wide dynamic range between the highlands and the shadowed craters. You can... You know, you want to get it on at night where the seeing's good. You want to do some high-quality stacking. There's some artistry and technique involved, for sure. Oh, shoot. The other thing I wanted to do, I'll do it after this exposure, is I want to change the format of the name here. I'm having to fix it in post, and it's annoying. I don't know why I put a B in front of it to designate that it was a separate run, but it's not necessary. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Renacal. I'm enjoying it. It's a nice little comet. It's easy to see in the live stream. And yeah, it comes out good in the time lapse. Back on target.
Hey folks, yeah, we got some significant cloud cover rolling in which took out the guide star and uh, that's going to actually do it for us for tonight, but uh, we had a good time there watching Comet C2020 T2 Palomar. Uh, I'll pull up the uh, final time lapse here. This works. Yeah, there we go. So there's the replay of Comet from this evening. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm going to be taking some more uh, calibration images here and then tearing down the telescope. But uh, I want to thank everyone for coming and watching. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing for more of uh, this great content as I bring you live views from the telescope. Till next time, clear skies, folks. <laughs>